Sorting through the BS known as draft season, the latest on Rasheed Rice and the impact speed has on NFL evaluations. And is it changing? We've got all that and more. I'm Jason Fitz. It's time for Inside Coverage. Welcome to Inside Coverage, part of the Zero Blitz family, where we dive into the how and why of all things NFL. Jory Epstein, uh, Charles Robinson, I'm Jason Fitz with Yahoo Sports. And guys, we got a lot to get into, a lot to talk about, but it would be weird, frankly, if we didn't address the big breaking news as we tape here this morning. I think everybody was a little jarred to see the breaking news that OJ Simpson has passed, uh, lost his battle with cancer at the age of 76. I just want to be real for a minute because we didn't really talk about how we want to talk about this, which I think is kind of key here because it's it's just complicated see rob like i I, as much as we talk about nfl hall of famers and their legacy when they pass there's also just this whole other conversation about oj that has nothing to do with football and i like i don't know the appropriate way to handle any of this on a day like today it's definitely something that is at the nexus of sports you know culture entertainment police brutality, you know, I mean, all the different things that were going on at the time of the OJ Simpson trial, um, the fallout from it. It was interesting because when the news dropped, it started a text message conversation between myself and others about like the day that the verdict was read in the OJ Simpson trial. For a lot of us, that is the sort of the height, the pinnacle of OJ being a part of our life, our lifetime, if it's not the Bronco chase, right? The thing that sticks out where we're like, this feels so surreal and eclipsed, you know, what the NFL's first 2000 yard rusher, a hall of famer, an iconic player at the running back position. And, you know, so it just starts this conversation about like, where were you at? What was the reaction? We we began to get thrust back into time when that verdict was read and sort of what it meant Socially, from a racial perspective, you know, uh, from an economic perspective, you go back to the the 30 for 30 on ESPN that was so fantastic on sort of unfolding all the elements of, of O.J. Simpson. Like you're like, I don't know how to get into this. That's a good example that you you kind of need six, seven, eight hours to really fully dive into what O.J. Simpson was how his life and career unfolded. And then obviously the the murder trial and verdict that. Uh, became a fabric of popular culture for us in terms of things that we remember in our lifetime and where we were when they happened. No, I do think it's interesting because, again, like I was born in 1994, like as all of this was kind of coming to a close. And so I do think there are people in my generation for whom the trial, the car chase, like those are much more what they think about, even the acting before they think about the football career, if they think about it at all, and certainly what he actually did on the film or on the field. And so It's definitely interesting just the different elements of society he touches on and how that evolved over time. And also now that he dies, like, does that story change? Does the story that we've been telling ourselves for the last 20, 30 years change now that you look back at someone's life more fully after they die? And I think I know like the Pro Football Hall of Fame put out a statement about or acknowledging his on-field accomplishments. And I do think that's sort of the struggle with a lot of things. I mean, we saw this in some of the Kobe coverage of like, how do you make sense of a guy who's as complicated as he was? And that's the reality is like, it's nice if we have a headline and a clean narrative for everyone. And I'm not saying that this is like, oh, we should just talk about what happened on the field independent of what happened off of it or what seems to have happened or how it was dealt with. But I, I think the reality is, OJ is not the first or the last athlete with, for whom this will be a complicated conversation. I, the funny thing is we're all trying to be careful with what we say and how we say it, which is part of the complication here. Like for me at some point, I, I feel like I've dealt with this a bunch in music. Like there are legends in music that influence my, my life that you find out later were terrible people, right? And how do you couch what somebody's music did to influence my life with the fact that you shouldn't be listening to the music anymore because they were terrible people. And this goes all the way back in, in history. The complication here for me will always be at the end of the day. And saying this is just, I'm going to have to get off Twitter after I say this, but At the end of the day, a jury of his peers found him innocent or found him at least not guilty. So he went through the legal process, was found not guilty, and then was never able to outrun the fact that people just didn't want to accept that that verdict. And so I'm not here to say whether or not he was guilty or not guilty. I just cannot I cannot imagine through this whole process going through a trial, 
being found not guilty of something horrific and then the rest of your life having people say, well, I don't care what a jury said. It's just you're damned if you do and damned if you don't. And and the way the, we cover everything, this show, I have stolen this concept from everybody from this show that I say all the time. Like you can't convince a conspiracy theorist to believe a fact, but you can convince them easily to believe another conspiracy theory. Some of that was born out of this trial because so there's such a distrust for the entire system based on OJ. So like it's complicated because nobody wants to accept anything that a jury had a chance to accept. And I know, again, saying that it, Twitter is just going to absolutely run with all of this. I just, man, it's it's hard for me because, again, I have to stress, it, he went through the legal process and the legal process in, in a, in a well, criminal, criminal court. court the criminal found him court found not guilty court. and the civil court found him liable. And so I think that that's different than just being found not guilty. I, they have different levels of burdened proof. And so, again, I think that goes back to just how hard it is to get some of this. Okay. He also entertained a book that was titled If I Did It, you know, and, and in that book, there's a very chilling representation of how this murder would have taken place. I understand and respect a jury's decision. I think there were a lot of different things that went into it at that time. He was always going to be judged in the court of public opinion after that verdict was was released. OK, and I, you know, I just don't even I, honestly, I don't give a about getting into all of it. Like it was what it was. Oh, it was it was a time in history where you had to make a decision about how you felt about an athlete, an entertainer, someone who was famous, someone who was wealthy. Um, and then this thing that happened and how all those how it all played into it and then how society um, had the mirror held up to it and and what we all thought and how people reacted to it racially or from a fan perspective or, you know, from the perspective of a man or a woman or I mean, there were so many different uh, things wrapped up in this. I, I will say this. The one commonality that I think is interesting is if you are of a certain age, you know where you were. When the verdict came out, like Fitz and I yeah. were old enough that we both I guarantee I can tell you I was sitting in a parking garage in my car. It was I was in college and I was late for class and I'm literally just sitting there listening to the radio for the verdict to come out. It comes out like I was stunned that that he was found innocent. I thought for sure it was going to be a guilty verdict. I get out of the car I, and, you know, I, I wasn't like outraged or anything. I was just I was just stunned, purely stunned because of everything that had unfolded over the course of, of that trial, I remember getting out of my car and seeing, I mean, literally it was like 20 other people getting out of their car who were all late for class and all of us running like into the building because we had sat out there and, and you could hear people saying stuff to each other while they were running into the building because everybody knew why they were all late and why we we're all getting out of the car at the same time. Fitz, I'm sure you've got a story about like where you were when it came. I, I was in a practice room in Chicago and somebody knocked on the practice room door and it was like, hey, verdict's about to be read. And we all sat there. And what I remember distinctly was after the verdict was read and there was all, all people from all backgrounds, all races standing around. We were all practicing different instruments, right? When the verdict was read, total silence. Like I remember just everybody sat there. St I, I, stunned is the right word. But then like right after that, there was a how do we even process this moment? And I think that was one of the things that's jarring and part of the reason everybody remembers this is because none of us knew how to process it. You didn't know if joy was the right reaction if you were on that side. You didn't know if, if angst was the right that reaction if you were on that side. Like everybody just sort of sat there and was like, what do we do now? And that that's like, I think that's cemented. And that's part to joy that to your point, I think that's part of why there's a whole group of people that like, I remember the room I was in during the, the, the car chase. I remember where I was when the verdict came down. I, I don't have a single memory, obviously, around OJ playing football. So it's just it's, it's why this is this is bigger than football. It's a cultural phenomenon. I literally like got to know OJ. I didn't know him as a child through I knew him through Naked Gun, right? Like through movies and Hertz commercials. Like that's how I initially knew OJ. And so even for me, it's not like I knew I knew his exploits as a football player because people talked about you know, he was right. if you watched football in the 1980s, it was you couldn't he he was a sideline, you know, commentator. And and so you kind of knew and and he had the nickname Juice, right? Like it was like the great unforgettable kind of there was so much that that got traction with me as a kid with him being a football player. Once I knew that was um, part of, I guess, his story and who he was. But 
yeah, it's a it's a weird day. This really is. A, it's it's this in and of itself is just a weird day and a weird sort of moment. All right, let's stick with the, let's move on to some of the news and notes going on from around the league and stick with the difficult conversation here is an arrest warrant has been issued for Rasheed Rice. For anyone that hasn't followed this, eight charges in the case, six counts of collision involving bodily injury, one count of collision involving serious bodily injury, one count of aggravated assault. So uh, remember, this is from the accident that he was involved in. He was, according to his attorney, driving the Lamborghini, uh, but then uh, he and his friends walked away from it on the highway. So uh, there was a little gap where nobody knew where she was, and now we know the charges are filed. So, see, Rob, I, I mean, what's the latest on this? What's the impact on this? Where are we with this? Well, so these are felony counts. So there is a very, you know, significant legal road ahead for him. He's, as his attorney has said, and we'll take his attorney at at his word, um, Rishi Rice is cooperating with authorities. I would have to believe that there would be an element of 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 a deal worked out between Rishi Rice and, and prosecutors in this case. There's going to be the legal ramifications. There's going to be financial ramifications because there were uh, individuals who were either injured or obviously had their their property, their cars damaged in this, um, who are going to seek punitive damages. So there's going to be some element of settlements, I would assume, coming forward. It has not happened. So um, in most cases like this, there's uh, an element of of settlement or you know punitive damages that, that the victims walk away with. I, the one thing that I did have a conversation um, with someone, uh, a, a league source that is kind of wired into the the league office. And what I was told was like, Hey, this could actually end up being a more significant suspension than maybe some people think, because I think some people go, well, there were, there were no fatalities. Like, you know, he, he's taken responsibility in terms of the element of saying, yes, I was behind the wheel. You can debate whether he was forced into that by video, you know, from the scene. Um, But Let's let this play out. I think the leaving the scene, the video that exists, and then some of the other elements of things that have happened with with alleged racing or speeding in vehicles. Obviously, the Henry Ruggs um, situation in Las Vegas that led to a, a fatality. The Jalen Carter um, allegations that he was uh, allegedly drag racing uh, at at the University of Georgia prior to being drafted. Uh, and there were fatalities involved in that incident. This person just said the league is going to take this really seriously. So this isn't going to they think right now, depending on how it unfolds, it's not just going to be a well, you know, <laughs> he made good on, you know, made making victims whole and he took on the responsibility they had to take on legally. This feels like it could be a moment where the league is like, we need to make a little bit of an example here. We will see now it's all speculative right now, but. I will just tell you, it feels like from this person I spoke to, the league office is watching this very, very, very closely and uh, not going to turn its back on how serious it really believes this was. And I also think it's worth noting that while Rashi Rice is responsible for what he did and not what Andy Reid's son, Britt Reid, did, while Britt Reid was a coach for the Chiefs and was drinking and then ends up paralyzing a girl, sending her into a coma. She's five years old and the rest of her life has changed. I think that if I'm the league, I'm thinking, can I trust the chiefs to deal with this? Can I trust them to dole out consequences? And if I ask myself that question, the answer is no. I think that Andy Reid had that with his son who was on the staff, who was drinking at the office, at the facility during the playoffs. This was not Britt Reid's first situation. This was not his first time when he endangered other people's lives. And now you have a player doing that. And I think that, again, if you're trying to figure out, well, how are we going to make sure this doesn't happen again, then the league steps in. And like C-Rob said, I mean, whether it's that, whether it's Jalen Carter before the draft, there are just so many instances where players don't seem to be getting the importance of this, the gravity of it, and and dealing with it accordingly. So I think that if Rashi Rice didn't think something serious was going to happen, he wouldn't have necessarily said like, yes, I was driving it. And I feel like also just the effect that he fled at the scene made him realize like, I need to take accountability or this is going to be worse than it already is. But I'm curious, Sierra, when you say a more serious suspension, do you expect this to be, I mean, six games is to me what I think of as like a serious suspension, like the threshold for it. Are you thinking six? Are you thinking 10? Are you thinking a year? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, it's, it would be 
again, it would be speculative for me to say, yeah. you know, any kind of a number here. And remember, the legal process is not played itself out. We don't know exactly what's what's going on in terms of the communication between Rishi Rice's attorney and, and the authorities. Obviously, it he's clearly taking part in some aspect of the process right now. And so we, you know, we don't know what the gravity is going to be ultimately when it comes to the legal ramifications. And that could also factor into ultimately what the NFL decides to do. I guess to me, what stuck out about the conversation I had was like the league is really taking this seriously. And it's and it definitely has echoes of other things that have had that have happened with speed and athletes and in in this league. And I and I know maybe some segment of Chiefs fans don't want to hear this. I, I really truly believe there's going to be an aspect of looking at this and going, what could have happened here? Like it granted it didn't happen there were not fatalities um but that was an extremely fortunate development that nobody died in this you know there's a a mother and a child that was involved in in part of this wreck and it was it was just an extremely dangerous um situation that unfolded and and it's clear the league is is not going to at least right now the thought process is that the league is not going to sit back and look at this as sort of a garden variety incident um, it's it's going to act accordingly to its investigation, what it sees unfold um, legally as well. And I I, I do want to mention here, I the one aspect of this, and it's not strictly like Chiefs related or Chiefs fans related or anything. It's more NFL fans and just fans in general. It really sucks on social media when you sit here and you're looking at this and you're seeing people say, you know, he shouldn't have admitted being behind the wheel. He should have had one of his friends take the fall for this. Or can we just take football out of this, man? Like, we don't we don't always have to do this and focus this through the prism of he's a player on my team. So I'm going to back <laughs> what just happened here or or act like it's not a serious situation. It is. And it has nothing to do with him wearing a Chiefs uniform. If this happens to anybody, and we all drive cars, by the way, we've all been in situations where people have probably flown by us, you know, going 100 miles an hour on the freeway. It's it's just the whole situation sucks. And I hate that we get this segment of fans and it happens with across the board. I think when this happens with players in the NFL and probably just sports in general, you have a segment of fans who are gross i mean i have other i can't think of another word to put on it but it's it's there's some reprehensible you see on on social media when it comes to this stuff does the league at some point have to address the gap between when the incident occurred and when he turned himself in because it creates a variable we can't know the answer to right like we will never know if he was drunk when he was driving I, it's pure speculation we never know but we can't know because he wasn't there to take any sort of tests or anything, right? Like, so the the amount of information that, that goes away because he didn't make himself readily available immediately, I just wonder how that impacts everything. Because it, 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 look, if, if, if he had been, if, if this had been worse or if he had anything in his system, those sorts of things would absolutely amplify the way we look at it. It amplify the punishment. It would amplify all of those things. And now we can just never get the answer because he was, away and i don't know how a league is supposed to handle that it wouldn't surprise me and again i don't have any inside information here but it would not surprise me if the league was like hey if you did this and you don't turn yourself in we're going to factor that into the punishment if you do turn that yourself in we're going to factor that in so i mean i would not be surprised if there was some degree of communication on how that was handled because this is like so many of the disciplinary elements of nfl policy are about protecting the shield and what it looks like and even see rob when i hear you say the nfl is taking this seriously well show us that and i'm not saying i don't believe you i do believe you but i think that for that belief to not be overturned the nfl has to come down with something it's on you know it's unknowable like you can't punish someone for some you can't make up something in your mind and just go well maybe this happened or maybe that happened or maybe this was the reason you know he, he left the scene um you can't punish someone for that you know I, I think you just now have to take in the totality of what happened what occurred he did leave the scene if you want to factor in that he left the scene Clearly, legally, that's being factored into the 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 charges against him. Um, but then you also have to factor in what he is now doing. He did through his lawyer 
admit that he was behind the wheel of a vehicle. So there's an element of at least taking that that responsibility. That, yeah, you know, I'm not going to say somebody else did it, uh, which could have occurred, which I wondered before the, his lawyer came out and said that. I was like, I wonder if we're going to ever find out who is actually behind the, the wheel of that Lamborghini. So he admitted to that. And you can decide why you feel like you admitted to it and judge in your own mind. That's to me, I'm just talking about from a legal sense. So um, I, I think there are going to be a lot of different things that potentially factor into it. But until it, you know, all unfolds, this is going to be speculation. I do agree with Jory, by the way. I do agree with you. Like the league can take things seriously and says it takes things seriously, but it's all about what the, what the actions ultimately end up being. And frankly, like even the Chiefs, right? The Chiefs, it's we we also can't just look at the league and go, well, what is the league going to do? <laughs> like sometimes you have to look at the teams and go, well, what are you going to do? Like you're you're the first point of of access here for these players, and uh, there has to be some responsibility on the front end with the teams, not just waiting, you know, to see what does the league office think about this? I mean, what do the chiefs think about this? All right. So let's get to some happier news. Uh, when people get rich, I get happy. Uh, Josh Allen, uh, very rich. The other Josh Allen. I love the concept of being great at what you do and then having to be the other Josh Allen because you have the same exact name as a quarterback in the NFL. But the Jags, Josh Allen gets a five-year, $150 million extension, puts him behind Bosa and Jones and uh, average uh, value per year among non-quarterbacks. Big money deal for Josh Allen. Not necessarily shocking that he got the deal, but uh, I love any time. You know, see, Rob, I love it when guys get paid. I Anybody, guys, girls, anybody that's great at what they do, they get paid. I love it. So Josh Allen gets that huge, huge, huge bag of cash. Yeah, making $25 million, you know, to $30 million a year, and you're you're the second highest paid Josh <laughs> Allen in the league is a rarity. Right. That doesn't So that's why doesn't you should name your kids Jory. Oh, that's, that's fair. <laughs> it, it, to me, I, I think what's interesting when the this contract came down I, I get it. I understand it. Um, cornerstone pass rusher on that defense. That's clearly the player that they had identified. They wanted to pay um, up front. There's a lot of talent on that defensive line. I think it's interesting, though, because it puts him into an echelon that when you look at statistically, you know, and his impact on games, I don't know that he's necessarily been a Micah Parsons or a, um, a, a Bosa. Like he's, Granted, he's up there. I just wouldn't say, Air, you know, Aaron Donald, Micah Parsons, TJ Watt. Um, there's there's a handful of like four or five, six players who we think of perennially being in that conversation. Is this the defensive player of the year? That to me is is where this contract trends into. They're they're sort of paying him like he's in the defensive player of the year conversation. Um, so the expectation moving forward for the Jaguars is okay. We've paid you. Now we're going to expect you to to maybe even kick it up into uh, that that realm. For the rest of everybody else, I think all this does is boost defensive uh, player contracts even higher. It's, at least in, in terms of like the elite level, Jory, Micah Parsons. We've had conversations about Micah Parsons. If I'm Micah Parsons, and you can speak to this, I'm staring at that contract and I'm going, okay, I'm worth 35. Then, like, I'm a 35 million dollar a year. Uh, a player when I compare my impact on games, my statistical, you know, impact and and how I fit into this Cowboys offense, I think I'm worth X amount more than than a Josh Allen with the Jaguars. By the way, Josh Allen, good player. I just don't think he's on the level of Michael Parsons. Yeah, I mean, I will say if you look at just like the num the stat that probably is most likely to be used in contract negotiations, Micah had 14 sacks last year and Josh Allen had 17 and a half. So, I mean, Josh Allen definitely compares favorably. I'll have to check. Let's see. Pass. I think it's more pressure, like the the sheer sack numbers. And that's I want I want people to be very careful about that. Just looking at a sack number. Right. Because that's people are like, oh, he had more sacks than him. So he is a better Look at pressures. Well, I mean, pressure's a yeah. huge stat in the NFL and Jory. Well, and this is the, what I was about to say is when you go to pass rush win rate, which is pretty important if you want to be able to get those sacks, Mike has got a 35% rate from last year, which is the number one. And Josh Allen is not top 20. And so I think part of this is if you are the Jaguars and you're looking at what the Texans are doing with Stefan Diggs and CJ Stroud, and you're looking at the Titans getting Calvin Ridley, and you're looking at what the Colts could be, although I don't think they're there yet with Anthony Richardson, you need someone to take down these quarterbacks and really to take down Stroud as line one. The issue is what does this mean for Trevor Lawrence? Cause you haven't paid him yet. And in, in theory, he's supposed to be the future of your team. And so again, the same way we look at Dallas and say, 
What are you going to do with CD, Micah, with um, with Dak? Well, okay, you let Calvin Ridley go in Jacksonville, but you still have Trevor Lawrence and Josh Allen. And so is he being paid to the degree to which he will help the team get to the next level? Like, is this a short-sighted decision? I don't know. Yeah, and just looking real quick at uh, Spot Rack or Spo Track or however anybody says, I don't know. Uh, just looking quick at the salary cap situation next year for the Jags that now includes the big money for Josh Allen, their estimated cap space is a whopping $9 million for next year. Uh, not this coming season, but the next season, $9 million. That is of consequence because the last time I checked, Trevor Lawrence is going to cost a lot of money. I, I mean, like they got to make it. I cannot believe I'm sitting here saying the Jags have to make a decision on Trevor Lawrence, but this is supposed to be a breakout year where it becomes absolutely undeniable that Trevor Lawrence is the future and lives up to the hype, right? Like, so they will have to make some financial uh, moves to try and figure out how to keep their quarterback if Trevor Lawrence has the season that they need him to have. When that extension is signed, obviously, I would suspect there's going to be a hefty signing bonus that will be spread over a number of years. There's a lot of creative things you can do to scoot the money around or, you know, just how they structure the base, um, where the guarantees fit in that contract. Like I, they can clearly get the, the Lawrence deal done without any problems. Uh, you know, they're just going to have to be um, creative with it. But like Jory says, there is an element though, once that contract kicks in, right. And you, you have Allen on this deal, it's, Remarkable to me how hard it is in the NFL now to have a $50 million, $60 million quarterback, which is where we're going, and then also a $30 million uh, defensive player. Now what do you do at the wide receiver position if you have a dominant wide? It's, it's right. Joy will speak to this. She's, they're play, it's playing right. out with the Cowboys right now, right? That's what we're seeing right. happen. And that's why you lose Calvin Ridley. And, hey, Calvin Ridley said in his introductory press conference with the Titans that he wanted to stay – in Jacksonville. And so I think some of something has to give, and that could already be what gave, but still is that enough? Um, and it is, I don't have a lot of sympathy for cap guys and cap people, I should say, and front office members who are like, well, we can't pay everyone. But I do wonder if there ever gets to a point in the NFL where we see, if not a reversal of the trends with the quarterback contracts and the pass rusher contracts, at least more of a plateau and less of a reset. Like think about Jalen Hurts and Lamar Jackson last year and how minimally they reset the market there. Like will we ever slow the degree or make less steep the degree to which these contracts are going up? Joy, aren't you sitting on it though right now? I mean, couldn't Dak be the reversal? The first reversal we see that's not Kirk Cousins where a team goes, yeah, we're just not, we're not going to do that deal. We're not going to pay the $50 million to $60 million because if Dak goes to free agency, there's zero doubt in my mind a team is going to offer him, especially if he replicates his performance in 2023. Don't we believe a team will offer Dak Prescott $50 million AAV, $55 million, maybe $60 million AAV yes. in free agency? So, yes. so don't, so Jory, I'm asking you, like, couldn't this potentially be stacking up for the Dallas Cowboys being the first team outside of the Kirk Cousins situation? to look at a quarterback who will go to the top of the heat potentially and saying, we just can't do it. We're not going to do that deal. But my point is not that a team will choose not to pay a quarterback. Cause if that were the case, again, we seem to have just seen that with Kirk cousins. I know Russ walked for different reasons. Aaron Rodgers walked for different reasons, but guys have left. My question is, will I guess maybe what you're saying is if enough teams stop paying guys Will the numbers go down? But to me, yeah. the numbers won't go down because right no, now I mean, with the nature of supply and demand at quarterback, someone will pay them. So the price doesn't go down. The question is just, do you keep them? Yeah, I mean, by the way, it only takes one team. But if all 32 owners, and we call this collusion, I know all the time, but I would say this. If all 32 owners looked at the books and decided, you know what? Individually, and not, not colluding together, but individually, there's a top market that quarterbacks are. We're not willing to go. If all 32 owners had the, the self-control to do that, we'd have a much different situation. Yeah, there's always a Jimmy Haslam, right? I mean, willing to fully guarantee a contract to potentially warp things. And there's always someone who's got, you know, tens of billions of dollars if you're David Tepper and you're sitting there going, why am I falling in line? Like, why do I can spend the money? Why do I have to worry about, you know, the 32nd small market team not being able to, uh, you know, arguably Charlotte's a small market, right? And and I'm willing to spend it. So everybody should be willing to spend it. It's inflation, you know, like Jory 
to answer your question, like, do we all really think the cost of groceries is going to go back to where it was? No. <laughs> <laughs> like, do we really think the cost of our insurance is going to go back to where it was? No. <laughs> like, it's this is but the new norm. But there are times when things increase more steeply and times when they peter out a little bit. Oh, it can plateau. I agree gas, with that. Gas like, yeah. sometimes goes down. Yeah. yeah in election like, years. That's it. Just, <laughs> everyone's like, everything's going to be fine. Gas prices are down. Yeah, I say as someone who no longer has a car while living in New York City. So who knows? I say to someone who's yeah, just Do you really in LA, know the price of gas, Jory? Like, are you... <laughs> as I, I, like, I was shook when I landed in LA and I got in the Uber and I saw a seven in front of the dollars. Like a, seven? A seven as I was leaving the airport a couple of weeks ago and I was like... Good God. All right. Uh, so speaking of, of getting rich, and I'm going to tie this into wide receivers because, you know, uh, realistically, as we see the biggest, best names are getting massive contracts, I think that puts more pressure on, you know, the young guys that are rising and more pressure on getting it right in the draft. So, Jory, you've been taking a look on Xavier Worthy a lot just because of his speed and the way they analyze it. What are you finding when you look at teams and the way they're looking at the wide receiver position? Yeah, I find this so interesting because for so long, for decades now, we've been like, how do you determine how fast a guy is and how you can use the speed? The 40-yard dash. And now you increasingly have this chorus of people who say, well, is the 40-yard dash the best way to judge speed? And is it even relevant to an NFL game where you rarely have 40 yards of open field in front of you? And so that's not necessarily the type of speed we're using. And yes, there are other drills, but I think that this is kind of a twofold thing where on one hand, there's how do you want to use the speed? On the other hand is how as a team evaluating a player, can you best determine the way that that speed will manifest? So um, I looked at Xavier Worthy, who's the Texas Longhorns receiver, and he reset the record this year with his 4.21 second 40 yard dash. And you say, so you have some people saying, well, then he's going to be super fast. Like, look at what the dolphins do. He's going to be so effective in an offense like that. And then I almost feel like there are a group of people who hold it against him in a weird way and be like, well, if he plays that fast, it's hard for him to stop and get in and out of his breaks and react in the way that he needs to. And if he plays that fast, well, Puka Nakua was really slow last year at his 40. And look what he was able to do with the rookie record. And so there's this weird course of people. And Xavier's so aware of this that literally at 718, the morning after he set the record, he tweeted out to people like, don't let the 40 fool you like the routes are there watch the tape and I was like kind of shocked that he tweeted that but I'm like that's how where people are of this narrative and it's not just it's something externally it's something in teams so I surveyed quite a few scouts executives and coaches just trying to understand and I think what I came across is a few things one while there is a group of people, particularly in the analytics community, who want to believe the 40 is dead, we should only go by GPS numbers, no one's running 40-yard dashes, there's something to be said for the historical precedent of the 40. In 10 years, we can go fully off GPS because then you can compare the GPS numbers from the guys in today's college world or in a couple of years to the guys in 10, 12, 14 years. Right now, you just don't have that. Even the gauntlet drill where people are excited about Puka Nakua last year and Keon Coleman this year setting top speeds faster than any other receiver in the gauntlet trail, which might be more reflective of game speed because you have to respond to balls and sort of do football actions while running the first 40 yards of it. That's also something that they started really tracking basically last year, and only this year did they start using the chips that they're using on game days. Now, when you look at college GPS, well, first of all, some teams told me that they're using optical tracking, which is this technology that will take film and say, based off what's happening on this film and where he started and where he ended, here's how fast he's going. Well, it's not perfectly precise. And then the second one is with the colleges that are using chips, and most of them are, especially the bigger schools, they're not standardizing the chips. And there's not like the NCAA is not governing this. This is you believing what the school says. Now, let's say the optical tracking is really, really close to what you see on the chip tracker. Well, think about it. Puka Nakua with his four, five, six. 40-yard uh, dash at his pro day last year would have ranked below 27 of the 30 receivers who ran the 40 at this year's combine. The 4 2 one to the 4 5 6, that's a difference between number one and a record and number 27 out of 30 or 28 out of 31 when you add them in. And so this precision really matters. And so 
actually talked to our colleague, Matt Harmon, for this story. And what I loved that he said is he was talking about how the reason he loves studying receiver is because receiver is not really one position. It's sort of like a bucket of positions that we call one position. But the guys who want an A.D. Mitchell or a Puka Nakua are not competing and comparing them against an Xavier Worthy. They have different roles in the offense with the X receiver, the Y receiver, the guy who's taking you to the top off your defense versus the guy who's going to get open on a crossing route. And so I think that basically what my research is leading to is to ask like how fast is a guy well what does it even mean to be fast in the nfl to ask what do you want from speed at your receiver well what kind of receiver are you looking at and all of this leads to a conclusion that most of the criticism that an xavier worthy or really any of these guys are getting is just based off of these false comparisons of who these guys are being compared against i think people need to understand when the 40 first started being measured it it was do you just want to know is a person fast or not Uh, because i I remember once asked a scout been doing it for you know 20 plus years i was like why don't you run 40s and pads like i'm like they play in pads run the 40 in pads doesn't that make sense to you guys and he was like it doesn't matter if they're fast out of pads they're going to be fast in pads like there's a you know objectively it's very rare to find someone that's super fast out of pads but then you put them in pads suddenly they're as slow as molasses um but as you said, there's all these other data points that are now flowing in, you know, 10 years from now, what is going to be standardized? You know, yeah, there are GPS trackers. Are they all the GP, same GPS trackers? How do you study these data points if they're not necessarily all from um, the same sort of company or line or or the, the usage? There's a lot of data flowing in, I think, 10 years, 20 years from now, which is a conversation, Jory, I mean, we've we've had recently about what the NFL is going to look like in 20 years. They're going to figure out how to refine this data and what really does matter. The gauntlet's a good example. I was asking a GM, we we're talking about the gauntlet, and I asked him, if a guy doesn't run the gauntlet, is that problematic to you? And he's like, well, yeah, it is. It's problematic because it, it's I want to see. The reaction, your ability to adjust because every ball is not perfect in the in the gauntlet. Um, it's going to show me hands. It's going to show me whether or not you can concentrate both on a ball and keeping a line. And we talked a little bit about Keon Coleman. And, and he said what Keon did at the combine in that great gauntlet, what it stuck in my mind was I think guys who run great gauntlets, regardless of what their size are, are very attractive to me to line up in the slot at times during games because gauntlet passes – are kind of like slottish passes. They're cl- yeah. you know, closer to the line of scrimmage. You're getting the ball out to somebody quickly. And so the gauntlet to him showed him, Keon Coleman didn't play slot in college. There was not a ton of slot sna- snaps. His size su- is suggestive. He's outside, right? But this GM's like, why do we always have to put the big guys on the outside? Why can't we take big guys and put them on the inside, particularly if they can run the gauntlet like that? How speed is measured is constantly going to get refined. I think Worthy is a really interesting example of it. I think, as you said, that tweet was a remarkably interesting example of it because it immediately raised into the consciousness of people. These players are thinking about that. Like, like, yeah, there's this big positive, but I'm fast. But now there's kind of this negative narrative sometimes that that is added to it. I had a a talk with a general manager about um, Lad McConkey, right? I, I I said he's I brought up the fact that he ran fast, right? I was like, oh, he showed up at the at the combine, he ran really fast. And he said, he said, yeah, that's great. He said, but that's not why he's good at Georgia. That's not why he's projected to explode in term like statistically at the next level. They're like, he was like, watch how he sets players up. That's the speed I'm interested in. When he's running at a corner, watch how quickly he makes this move or that move, and it causes the cornerback to do something. He said, at some point, we're gonna measure that. At the point of the route, when you're within a certain distance of a cornerback who, let's say, isn't playing press coverage, is playing off coverage, he's like, we're going to measure this little, you know, one second of time, and we're going to see how fast are you putting a move together to to break in and out of um, a route. He's like, we'll get to that point where I think we'll be able to say... Point three four is where you want to be when, when you, you get within, you know three yards of the corner and you're putting a move on or whatever. So uh, I, I'm so excited to read this story, by the way. This is, I think this is such a brilliant idea. By the way, Jory's writing on it. It, it drops Tuesday. Is that right, Jory? 
Yes, that's the plan. The story should drop Tuesday. And I love what C-Rob said about, hey, that's not how Vlad McConkey uses his speed. Because one of the guys that, or one of the scouts I asked about Xavier Worthy, and I'm like, do you care? Because I had a GM tell me, like, we knew he was fast. If he was in the bucket of fast players for him beforehand. And then I had a scout tell me, yeah, but if he's 165 pounds and he's as small as he is, then he needs to run really, really fast. And so he did it. Like, you showed... I am going to be able to use my speed at the next level. Like I'm going to be able to use that trait and it will offset my size at certain points in the game. And so the role that teams want him to play will depend heavily on his ability to hit those speeds and to be efficient in how he uses his speed. And Worthy showed, yeah, I can do that. And oh, by the way, I had 26 touchdowns at Texas. I had like 2,700 yards, like top three, top four in school history. I was producing with it. I wasn't just a decoy to stretch the field and let someone else produce. Yeah, oversimplification too. But if you just watch some of those games, the amount of times he got open against quality opponents, like I just, that that's where it's never any one thing, right? It's all of these things together in a bucket that make people fall in love with players. I love your point though. And I want to drill down real quick and just remind everybody standardization of technology. Like we have to remind ourselves sometimes the world's changing so quickly. And just imagine for any kid that ever took the SATs, if every school did the SATs different, it was a slightly different test. And mm. you know, like, and then we're trying to compare one score at the end to get you into college. Like there's going to have to be standardization of this technology, right. which I think will happen. It's just, you know, this is where you got to press pause and be a little patient. Like it's going to take I, a few years. Don't, don't you think these schools are going to look at the NFL and go, you want us all to standardize this, then you pay for it. You pay like for if you, it. If you I wonder if that's standard. the future. That <laughs> yeah, makes sense. I mean, if I'm the NFL, I'm you, like, okay, cool. If you told coaches and for sure personnel people, put that out, like, give us that budget and we'll do it. I think all of them would vote to take the budget out of something else in the building. Do it. If you say, hey, owners, do you want to shell out more money? Nope. Hmm. No, they I, don't I don't think to, I don't think they'll no. do it. No, they don't. They definitely don't want to do that. But they I don't care. I, they should. I to me, if you're colleges and you're going, hey, we know you're pissed that we aren't all using the same GPS or whatever. OK, you can fix it because we don't care. Like, in, although I do wonder if your college is now that the and we'll see where the transfer portal ends up after, you know, the next couple of years unfold. But colleges have to use that data too right so i probably if if you're looking mm, at guys in the transfer that's portal, a good point you you're it's the same deal like you don't want to be like well we use this and this this guy's coming over from wake forest and they use this so i but i don't know if the numbers really are are as accurate as what we have right at the college level even if you're going from a smaller school to a bigger school it's still more apples to apples the way you're playing nfl there's so much gap room and so much void that you're trying to project across that you're really trying to get as as precise as you can. But I think the other challenge here is if you were to tell teams, hey, in one to two years, this could be really, really valuable, that would feel very different than if you say, hey, in 10 to 20 years, this could be really valuable when many of you are not still working at the places you're working now. And I think that's the problem. Like Keegan Abdu, who I, I talked with from Next Gen Stats, I give him a lot of credit for his intellectual honesty. He's like, look, yes, my team has great data from this year's gauntlet drills. Yes, we took this Next Gen Stats model. We updated the technology. We updated the models. We figured out what we didn't like about the way it was giving us data in batches last year and streamlined the rules that we were feeding at this year even so he's like i would not draw something conclusive from two years of good data because you just don't know like there's just too much noise in the sample size and until you repeatedly prove something how do you know that what puka was doing was because of the way he was able to react really quickly coming across the field and not because matthew stafford happens to make receivers a lot better and sean McVay figured out the exact right way to use him in the offense and so there are other variables going on with puka's production and don't you guys think all it really takes is like one dud right like let's say mm -hmm. keon coleman yeah. comes mm -hmm. out and and next year we're looking at him we're going yeah, he can't get separation. Like that's a problem. Like he, yeah, he ran fast in the gauntlet, but it's he's not getting separation on the NFL level. So all of a sudden, you're throwing. Like we're all looking at Puka, and we're like, this is this. It's we're kind of dream casting, right? Like I, I'm, I was watching the gauntlet, and I'm like, okay, here we go. Now this is like this thing that blows our minds. It was like that little brief period with the S two. We're like, oh, look at the guys who had the big S two scores, and then you know, it only took one year of CJ Stroud and going. Yeah, it's kind of a like like thing. Like maybe we were too excited about that. I mean, yeah. I'm also going to be a bit of an ageist here, but like in my mind, many of the NFL owners 
don't really understand how to get ways to get them to drive them anywhere. They don't realize they can just ask Google to, to turn on and off their like. I just feel like technology is not something that necessarily all of these owners are running to in everything that they do. So trying to explain to them why they need to put GPS uh, chips and standardized in every college to help them get better. If, like, I just, I feel like there's there's a bunch of old school guys there that might be a that's little off. Change. What percentage of owners change, do you right? think are driving themselves and even need GPS? That's fair. Yeah, that's, that is that's, fair. That's, that's a really yeah, that good is, point right there. <laughs> that is actually the I'm best like, I don't... <laughs> And by the way, Fitz, owners are getting, like, it's going to, they're going to get younger as we move forward. Like, in terms of, they're going to come from a different era where, yeah. where it's going to be a very technology-driven era. I, I have a hard time looking at, like, a David Tepper and going, that guy doesn't know the value of technology. <laughs> like, no, I that's would, that's fair. That's does. fair. <laughs> I, I'm, you're right. I'm definitely thinking of a different group of owners. Like, there's, there's definitely, there's going to be a changing of the guard at some point, inevitably, unless... Somehow owners have figured out how to be immortal. I don't want to be fully obnoxious, but was that the nicest thing we've ever said about David Tepper? Well, that's the nicest thing David Tepper's ever deserved to have said about him on this show. All right. It's it's draft season, and that means everybody's throwing shit against the wall to see what sticks. Just how much are they throwing against the wall? That's what we'll figure out next as we look at some of the biggest and best draft rumors going on in the classiest way possible. Let's take a look at some draft rumors, but we're going to do this. Uh, we're going to we're going to basically rate the pile of poo that's coming at us. I just came up with pile of poo and I kind of like it. I'm just going to keep using that over and over and over again. It's we're going to have classic. to have a mutiny if you keep this up. I can't say pile of. Uh, what, let's, uh, is there Sierra, any other help me. pile of poo? Come on. All right. So we're going to look at some rumors that are out there. We're going to figure out just on a scale of one to five. You guys can use on a scale of one to five, one being the least amount of just you don't buy this, five being the most. I'll continue to be the one that associates it with the pile of poop. So we're going to go with Wait, the- Wait, can uh, I t I'm going to yes. interrupt and be annoying for a second. Our colleague, Charles McDonald, tweeted a bathroom-related tweet yesterday, and I was telling someone in my family, like, our plan for this podcast today, and fits his great idea for all this poop, and I'm like- I thought it was funny when C-Mac did it. I want to laugh at it, not be the producer of this content. So anyway, I'll just be in my like bubble of one to five. Who knows what the measurement is? Yeah, one to five uh, patties of poop. Uh, that's what we're doing. Uh, one to five uh, cow, cow patties on all this. One being the least. Like, hey, maybe there's something there. Five being the, oh my God, this, is, this thing is so full of you know what that it's hard to even get through. Let's start with the big one that is just all of a sudden launching everywhere. And then that it's that Malik, neighbors has some quote high maintenance issues and quote there are off the field issues neighbors has had to answer during the draft process teams must feel comfortable with those answers if they're going to invest an early pick and millions of dollars i've even heard he can't be trusted in big cities see rob on a scale of one to five patties of poop how much uh, how much relevance are we giving this one like hey there's some truth to it five this is just absolute horse you know what I'm going to leave the vernacular to you when it comes you. to the, the descriptive elements. So I will give this a five, though. Like it's I. The the thing about the neighbors, uh, you know, is he got a little bit of a diva quality to him? Would he be a problem in a big city? This ego element. I I, I remembered, and I remember this every year, especially when we get a couple weeks out from the draft. I can go to almost any. I can sit there with the Rolodex and go. If I want somebody to say something crazy about Caleb Williams, I could look down that Rolodex and pick out, okay, I know he would. I know that person would. I know this person would. Um, it's it's not hard to go out and get a negative sort of uh, notion of a player if you really want to do that. And, um, and I'm not saying I, – I know who had this piece of information. I'm not saying that's what he was seeking out. But we have a lot of calls, and I'm sure Jory can speak to this too where you sit there and you hear um, individuals on the personnel side will kind of rant about a player they really don't like or why they think this player is ranked ahead of that player. You can't report that. Like you can't, like it's, it's just, it's not, unless there is some hard piece of data there, I'm like, okay, you're just, I, I, I can do the hot take thing too. And, and I, I get it. And I think there is definitely some evaluation behind it. But that's a five for me. I just neighbors is up until this point in the process, I'd never heard any problems about Malik neighbors. I'd never heard this idea, the big city stuff. I never heard. I, I think that you have a player who's going to be very, very highly drafted. He's very, very close to Marvin Harrison in terms of the split. 
And it's always interesting when this comes out this deep into the process. I totally agree with you. Anyone can say anything. I also think just the language that people use kind of takes on lives of their own that I'm wondering if even the reporter who said that means, because if you said a receiver is a diva, yeah, a lot of them are are considered divas. A lot of them want the ball more. A lot that's the competitive spirit that makes them great. Some people would even say there's an element of being a diva or being, um, I guess, hungry for attention. A meek makes you hungry for the ball and to deserve that attention. Now, I'll also say when I was talking to scouts for the story about receivers, I had one telling me that he gave him a better grade than Jamar Chase coming out of the draft. I thought that was pretty interesting. He said he thinks he's more competitive and tough and physical. You can have all the talent in the world. If you're not competing and showing it every snap, it doesn't matter. That's a direct quote from one of the scouts I talked to. And I had others tell me that they would rank him above like number one, I mean, the whole like Rome, Marvin Harrison, Malik neighbors. I feel like if anything, it wouldn't surprise me if someone who had a Marvin Harrison Jr. I guess agenda was like, well, Roma Dunze is literally impossible from what all the scouts say to like say anything against. So I guess we'll go to neighbors, which is not to say that neighbors is easy to make fun of, but everyone's just like Roma's like a hundred out of 10, like all the scouts love him. I don't know. I, I don't think that this is going to be a concern. And if anything, again, we talked about this earlier on the show, what happened with CJ Stroud in the S2 uh, leaks last year, which happened around a very similar time as this high maintenance leak, I think should raise any red flags. So yeah, I'll, I'll give it a five. Fitz guarantee. Fitz guarantee you I could find a, a, a scout that would go, can't trust anybody who's that perfect. Anybody anybody who you like that much is hiding something. Wait, you know what's <laughs> funny? So obviously it's a big thing at the Combine when like, Marvin Harrison Jr. was doing nothing. And I think what was it? Malik neighbors didn't weigh in and a lot of guys weren't doing something. So one scout told me that this scout was on a plane with like 10 other scouts because a bunch of them end up on the same flights between pro days. And he's like, we literally all just had this conversation about how much we love Roma Dunze. And we were having this conversation that not only did Rome give us like every measurement that we wanted and he was such a good sport about it, he was basically encouraging all of the other prospects to also participate and give us the measurements. Oh, he's a narc. Like, <laughs> that's that's what i would i think no way and he's then a I company went back man and watch rome's podium because i wasn't there live and he was like i just feel like i only have one compet one one chance to compete against everyone who came before me and everyone who came after me and this is my chance a one-time chance in my life to really be that competitor and i'm like wow you should show this to marvin harrison jr i, I do want to point out malik is from louisiana he played at LSU, where he is essentially a rock star in that community. How do we know if he's going to be anything in any big city when he's never even had to deal with that? I just want to point that out. So we we go ahead, Joy. Also, what does that even mean, a big city? Like, okay, let's say you're playing for the Jets and you're like, we're coming to New York. Florham Park takes me two hours to get to yeah, New York good, City. Like, yeah, like the really Giants, you can maybe get there in 45 minutes. Dallas will now Frisco the facilities half an hour. So, like, how L.A., Agora Hills, I mean, no one's in these cities. Yeah, that, have, that, you ever, uh, have, have you ever driven to Flowery Branch? Like how far is it? <laughs> right. feels like feels like it's you might as well be, you know, in South Carolina at that point if you're the Falcons practice facility. So we communally agree that that gets five stinky stacks. There's a we're out on that one. No, no, no. we is, communally uh, agree it gets five. Yeah, you decide five. the rest of that. We get five and I made it stinky stacks. All right. So uh, while we're sitting here talking about some uh, controversial takes, Jim Harbaugh wants to take a tackle at five now. I think there's 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 this is interesting, guys, because the Chargers picking five and Harbaugh's made it clear that, you know, quarterback should go one through four, of course, because he has no vested interest in what really happens and it would leave him best player available. But people find it hard to believe that the Chargers would want to take a tackle at five when they have no wide receivers. So the concept that the Chargers are going tackle at five and this is all about getting big boys up front. How many piles of poo do we give that? How many on a scale of one to five? Again, one being the least, five being the most. This is absolutely egregious. Just horse, you know what? Where are we on this one, C Rob? Oh, I want Jory to answer this first. No, Jory, where are we on this one, Jory? I want to hear what she says about this. I'll give it a three, and here's why. I think they're going to take an offensive tackle because that's what they need. I think when you look at the Chiefs and you say, hey, we have a really talented quarterback, what's the best way to allow that quarterback to go off? They invested in their offensive line rather than their receiver room. They allowed Tyree Kill to leave and traded him and said, offensive line is more important. And so I think that the best thing the Chargers can do is give Justin Herbert the best offensive line. The reason I give it a three rather than a five is because I do not put it past Jim Harbaugh to not make something up. I do not think that he has even kept to that in this draft cycle. I think he is 
elevating J.J. McCarthy beyond what's actually reasonable. And at C-Rob, I know we'll get to your J.J. McCarthy takes. And so I'm not saying that McCarthy won't go high, but I think that Harbaugh is being like, McCarthy's the best quarterback in the draft, which is a very convenient thing to say when you coached him in college, you coached nobody else in college, and you already have a quarterback. And so three, because I think the statement is credible, the giver of the statement, not credible. That's a really good answer. But she did steal my number, by the way, because I, I also think three. Um, I'm approaching it a little bit differently. I think Harbaugh knows that there's trade interest potentially with his pick at five, seeing who slides. It, even if the quarterbacks all go off at four, that means you have the pick of the litter at five. Well, that's going to be attractive to a number of teams out there. Maybe you know he's trying to entice the Titans to push up to the fifth overall pick. Maybe there's a, a, a team a little further back. Maybe it's the Jets at 10. Hey, come to five and get the top tackle off the board. Um, but I also think when you're the Chargers and you're looking outward, it's a deep enough draft at receiver. You could probably slide back a little bit in that top 10. Um, it's a deep enough draft also, though, with tackles that you could you could slide back inside that top 10 and maybe even top 15 and still get a quality uh, tackle or a guard. I think there's an element of real interest there. Harbaugh believes in the offensive line. We saw it at Michigan. It's how he built the program. Um, but I also think Jim Harbaugh knows how to play the game. And right now he's making sure that he's got all his bases covered. So if someone is interested in moving up to that spot, um, that's, you know, something he's going to be open to. Here's a question I have for you two, though. Let's say it's the Vikings that move to four, right? Or a team, any team moves to four for that quarterback. Everybody is saying right now it's going to be a massive premium, especially if it's going to be the Minnesota Vikings. Like the Vikings may have to give up both first this year, a first in 2025, and maybe another plus draft pick down the line. That's a massive premium to get to four for a quarterback. If they give that up and then someone calls the Chargers at five, what do the Chargers do in that situation? Don't you still have to ask for that massive premium, even if they're not moving up for a quarterback? Could you conceivably take two first round picks to let someone move up to five when the Arizona Cardinals may have just gotten three plus to move up to four. So I, what do you do in that situation? I'm curious what the two of you think. I, I mean, to me, the chargers have a lot of needs, right? And so if I can get multiple and they have a lot of needs and they have a lot of patience, we know that this is the beginning of an era for Harbaugh. If I can get a bunch of premium picks I would do that. But to your point, I never really thought about the fact that there's going to be just a massive difference in trade value. I, uh, we we talk about it all the time on the show. I don't believe there's 32 caliber starting caliber left tackles in the NFL right now. I think if you're picking at five, you make your life simple and you go get one of those 32 caliber starting caliber left tackles like that. That to me makes a ton of sense. But you're right. Like I would be enticed to trade down, but you're not going to get the same value. And that's just, it's going to, it's going to feel gross. So I think you stay put and you take the best player on your board at five. Well, I've talked to a couple of different people about compensation and they go back to the same thing. They're like, they made the decision with Kirk. They're sitting there with Sam Darnold, wherever the Vikings move, if it's four or five or wherever the team on the other end of the line is going, you're not going <laughs> like Sam Darnold's not going to be your guy. Like that's yeah. not your long-term answer. So you're going to pay us to move up. They've lost leverage basically is what I've been yeah. told that, you know, if you're taking that call. Yeah. And I think it's interesting because if you believe he's your quarterback, you should do it because you're just going to like, you need that guy to build your franchise around. You need that guy to keep your job as GM and head coach. Like you're not going to be able to be mediocre forever. And Hey, I talked to Quasi Adova Menza, the Vikings GM a couple of years ago. And it's sort of like you, without that quarterback, you can't get there. And he, he knew that that was something that needed to be on his radar. And so I think the question is, do you believe in a JJ McCarthy or whoever you'd be trading him to get 70% or do you believe in him 95%? And if you believe in your dart, you do pretty much whatever it takes. So we are, by the way, giving three discs of dung to the card oh, to the Chargers. <laughs> Good Lord, man. This is, here to, this, is, this is some of the here. best content you've ever made. See, Rob, you feel good about this? I, I, feel, I feel I feel like it's cool. I, I would say we are spiraling, but I'm afraid that he would like Fitz would actually stick some kind of poop reference. To that too, so. <laughs> oh man, glorified child. We all know that. Uh, let me get one more in real quick before we get out of here because we've been talking quarterbacks. So I'll let you guys have a choose your own adventure. Okay, you can pick any one of these. I'm going to give you three scenarios to a quarterback. You can pick any which one that you want to react to. JJ McCarthy at two, 
Jaden Daniels at two, or the slide of Drake May? Any of those three things that you want to assign, whichever amount of I'm not buying it in. So JJ at two, uh, Jaden Daniels at two, or the slide of Drake May. See, Rob, what do you got? What if you kind of believe in all of those? <laughs> like, I mean, what if what if they're all really? You you believe that both JJ and Jaden Daniels will be oh, number two? Take <laughs> <laughs> yeah. like that, I, take that, please, please give me the argument for that. A, this is a good question or that, because or it, that Washington is going to pull a Houston and go two three, but for both quarterbacks. That'd be it's amazing. A, I, it's a good question because it's not. It's so undone right now, and I I mean I have an answer, but it, the problem is is it's really like a. Th- it's a three it's it's all wrapped up in if McCarthy goes two, then I do think there's a little bit of a slide for me. So then there's there's two. I would I would say those are ones right for. But like one is dependent on the other, whereas like if Jaden Daniels goes two, I, I think it's a very real possibility. McCarthy goes three. So it's 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 we're asking about three different things that there's some interconnectivity there. Um, if I can only choose one. I would say it's probably May sliding because I do think there's very, very, very legitimate interest in uh, JJ McCarthy now at two. Now that, and I was the one at the end of March was like, everybody relax about JJ McCarthy being taken second. Um, Now that we're a little bit further down the road and I'm talking to different individuals about how like these workouts went, how boards appear to be stacked right now. I, I, I would say the interest is very much legitimate at two for McCarthy. I think it's legitimate at three um, with the Patriots. And I continue to hear people harp on, on Drake May. Now, Nate Tice, who obviously we work with, he has a conspiracy, or I think he believes in my conspiracy that I sort of threw out in our meeting the other day, which was like, are people doing this because they want, they really want Drake May to slide? Like, is he the guy who's kind of getting negged right now in the process? Because actually, no, everybody really does like Drake May, and they just need to see if he can potentially slide down the board. But I I think of all those scenarios, the one that that I find most plausible is is May sliding just because I'm hearing such great things about McCarthy in the two in the two and the three slot. I'll go the opposite way, which is the one I find least plausible. And I don't think the commanders are going to pick Jaden Daniels. I think he's a fantastic player. And I think he has a lot to offer any team, but I feel like we're trying to peg him to Washington because Cliff had Kyler Murray and that. And so everyone's like, well, the Cliff Kingsbury offense is one with someone who's super mobile, super athletic, like crazy athlete, like Kyler was. And I don't think that that's necessarily what Cliff has to do. I think that Cliff can build an offense. And again, whether that succeeds or not, I think he will build an offense around the guy. And I was with Dan Quinn at owners meetings in March when he was talking at length about the importance of processing, the importance of running the offense. Again, not to say that Jaden Daniels can't, but what was emphasized was not the athleticism. It was that processing. But what I would ask you, see Rob is when you say you think Drake may could slide especially if McCarthy goes second is that because you think that Jaden Daniels would go to the Patriots or the Patriots would trade down that's that's an interesting question I I do think that there's interest in Daniels too at, at three as well I I have not heard as much negativity in the personnel community about Daniels and about Daniels tape and and we also are getting to a point now where you brought up the flight where all these scouts are near. They're all running into each other now in different places, right? Oops, and they're, they're and they are definitely spending time in bars together. They're talking. They're probably saying things they shouldn't say about the feelings about certain players in their buildings. We should and just start booking whatever flights the scouts are on. That, when you Sourcing. said that, I was like, man, how come I couldn't be in the flight right now <laughs> and, and just listening to everybody? It's just hard not to hear all this stuff about. Um, May's tape and the the uncertainty going from two years ago to last year and how much more inconsistent last year's tape was. Someone even brought up Will Levis. They're like, remember when Will Levis had that superb year? And then the, the next year, there was somewhat of a fall off. He's like, there's some similarities there in Drake May's tape. Superb year, big fall off, at least from in his eyes, in terms of um, the consistency and accuracy and some of the things that Drake May was doing. So that that to me is what really kind of leans into um, this idea. That you, it's, when I say slide, by the way, I mean to four. The, but yeah, like gotta believe the Vikings at that point are like, oh man, let's go get Drake May um, at at four. We've got Josh McCown um, on our staff. 
there's we got an offensive head coach. I think they would be, I would think they would be overjoyed to have him um, at four. I'll be curious to see when this is all over to find out who was lying and who really just disliked certain quarterbacks that we thought they did like. That is the end of our rating of stink stacks. I got one more in for you just for you, see, Rob. Uh, as I, I don't think there's any way I can break, make this show less classy for the rest of the day. Uh, we've, we've run long, so we should let everybody know that I'll be back Tuesday with zero blitz uh, because there's a little bit of a special uh, change in the schedule. See, Rob and C Mac together Monday with the special exemplist covering the all juice team. See, Rob, tell everybody what to expect. Tell everybody about Therese Paylor's legacy. Tell everybody what's going on. Yeah, Therese Paylor's uh, annual All Juice team. We're going to have that uh, rolling out next week. Very excited about that. And uh, as always, make sure that you go and check out breakingtea.com slash Therese for the All Juice tea and hoodie. Um, all proceeds from that purchase go to support the Therese Paylor Scholarship at Howard University. You can support that directly as well as the scholarship in his name at Missouri if you check out our podcast description. While you're there, be sure to rate, subscribe, review, tell your friends, family, enemies, tell everybody to hang out with us next week. I promise less poop jokes. I, I, that's a that's a that's an easy bar to hit. In the meantime, thanks for hanging out with us. We'll be back next Thursday with more inside coverage.